guys, thank you so much for watching another video from Urban Lifestyle. Today we have a special guest on the uh, Urban Lifestyle show today. We have Mr. James Anderson from SD Bullion. How's everything going, Mr. James? Good. How you doing, Eli? I'm awesome. Thank you so much for asking. All right. So um, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, so for those who don't know, SDBullion.com is a high volume bullion dealership here in the United States. We're located in uh, in Southeast Michigan, uh, right near Toledo, Ohio. Uh, I've been in this industry just over a decade now, and um, my main tar my main task here, I suppose, is content marketing mainly, is uh, trying to get the end users who come to SD Bullion uh, to understand the fundamental reasons for why they're, you know, potentially buying precious metals or selling precious metals, etc. And understand it's more than simply just a spot price. There's a whole long history as to uh, motivations as to why someone might put a prudent allocation into precious metals. So that's essentially what I do at this uh, at this location. All right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you guys so much for watching another video of Urban Lifestyle, where our goal is to help you guys create a better life. And you guys can help out by leaving a subscribe, leaving a comment, leaving a thumbs up. Find me on my social media platform, Urban Lifestyle 1989. And don't forget to hit that notification icon so you guys get future notifications of my future videos. Let's go. All right, so um, James, I just want to ask you because um, I was watching um, Salvates on um, Salvates Metals, uh, the, the streams you did with him, the live stream you did with him, mm -hmm. and um, I think Tyler said that you was into uh, precious metals and he was into the stocks, right? Uh, no, that was the other founder that he started gotcha. the company with gotcha. originally. I, I okay. know him; his first name's John. Okay. Are Are you yourself? Excuse me. Are you yourself? Are you um? Do you, do you stack silver? What, what we like to call it? Sure, sure. I uh, I, I suppose my you know, if we go all the way back, it's, you know, from childhood when I was really, mm -hmm. really little, you know, my, my granddaddy and granny had uh 90% silver in the closet. I suppose a lot of older folks did that. Mm -hmm. You know, once they started taking silver out of the coinage, I think older people knew, uh, maybe we should save this instead of spend it. And okay. so there was just, you know, all types of jars full of silver. And that kind of got me intrigued. It wasn't until I got a little older and, and went to the university and started studying finance that I really went down the rabbit hole of, you know, monetary system and how it all works. I was lucky to have gone to a university where some of the professors were uh, Austrian school uh, economists. They would give you the Kinsey and Jive about the Federal Reserve and, you know, how it works and all that. They'd give you the basics, but they'd also add a little bit of flair into the uh, into the conversation as to why maybe it's not the most prudent monetary system that we've chosen. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, just kind of went down the Ron Paul rabbit hole in 2007. I got involved with that campaign and uh, that kind of led me into the industry because I was by that time was investing in the stuff. I had spent a good amount of time already learning about it and understanding it. And uh, and that just one thing led to another. And I ended up started to work in the industry when I was living out in Southern California and uh, started, you know, really, really going full on in and buying and investing in it probably 2008, right, right as the financial crisis was happening. Okay. Okay. Now, when did you start with um, SD Bullion? Right. I started with SD just over a year ago. Oh, okay, story okay. Yeah, it was by happenstance. I was in Cleveland working for a, another uh, company in the industry doing marketing for them. And, uh, you know, everything worked out. I mean, I was only a couple hours away. So I drove over here and we met and kind of like minded and saw the same stuff. And it, it made sense. So nice. Nice. OK, so um, the next question, pretty much um, with all the online bullion dealers out there, what, what is it that you guys are doing? Because I know I got um, someone who asked me that question for me to ask you as well, but that was one of my personal questions. What is it that SD Bullion is doing to stand out from from the others? Right. I mean, so first and foremost, this is an industry that's mainly trading the same stuff. You know, mm -hmm. we're talking about precious metals and they're mostly it's a commodity business. So what we're doing different than others, I would say what makes us different is uh We've been pretty strategic with our overhead, keeping it as low as possible. I think southeastern Michigan, Toledo area is a little bit cheaper to operate than some of the larger, um, you know, Davids in this uh, in this mm -hmm. industry. I, I mean, not Davids, but Goliaths. I suppose we're mm -hmm. more than David. Gotcha. Um, so what we do is we, we kind of use that uh, to hopefully give value to our customers by keeping the overhead low, we're able to help them save more when they're buying. And so I think that's mostly the main, uh, the main differentiator between us and the larger dealers perhaps, but you know, we are a top five dealer in the United States, so we are pretty mm -hmm. large. Uh, but that, and then the systems and Tyler, Tyler's very skilled with the, when it comes to the back end of the, the website, the ability to handle thousands of orders in a day and, and get it out. And the fact that we're vertically integrated, 
Um, sometimes companies aren't. They maybe use a drop ship fulfiller to do some of the fulfillment, and a lot of the you know orders are being drop shipped right here in Toledo. So that's that's typically you know we have the ability to go down the street and there's our vault and and make sure that all the packages are done the way we want them. So sometimes that helps you know when you're talking about adding that extra level of service for customers. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's good. Now I did have a question from um, somebody in the community. Um, stacking nerd, especially when you said um, you said Tyler takes care of all the internet work, groundworks, mm -hmm. right? Now I don't know if you'll be able to answer it, but she practically says in Salivate's interview, they mentioned that they're leading automation in order to keep the prices low. Being a software engineer who writes custom automation software for manufacturing, this is really interesting. Could they, without giving trade secrets, share what happens from when an order is placed to when it is shipped out? Yeah, I mean, there's, oh, I mean, there's tons of bells and whistles that go on the back, right? Mm -hmm. Between the time someone places the order, locks in the price, between then and all the way to, you know, putting the putting the uh, shipping and handling and all that stuff on the box, you're talking about a multi-step process. Um, as far as the details, I, I really can't go into all the nuts and bolts because personally, I haven't been the one that's programmed it. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was surprised though, this past year we got so busy one day, Tyler came to my desk and asked me, he's like, hey, can you go to the fulfillment center and fill in and help out? Because we got, you know, overwhelmed with a lot of orders. So I actually had to go there and do the pick, pack and ship job for a day. And that was, uh, that was good because, I mean, when you hear a lot of times about um, in Japan, a lot of times the way that their theory works is that the managers there sometimes make people do other people's jobs for a day. So they get a better holistic idea of how the business runs. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, you know, basically a case in point where I got more of a holistic idea of what these pick, pack and shippers have to do day in, day out. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, it, it's pretty it's pretty amazing the amount of. Uh, you know the amount of work that goes into it and sometimes the premiums are so slim on some of the things that we're selling sometimes we even make a loss and it's just more of a market share game but um you know it's economies of scale that really applies this so if you have a thousand orders and you're making a slight profit margin on each it adds up and that's how you're able to pay for the lights and the uh the employees etc exactly okay okay that makes sense now i do have another question of from robert himself he says um now that you're doing um interviews with a whole bunch of stacking channels are you considering carrying channel bars channel bars oh that's a good question you know it always depends so when we're thinking about a product that we want to carry mm -hmm. there's there's a there's a few things that come in play and first and foremost it's recognition demand how fast will this thing turn over um you know because what you don't want to do is put a whole lot of money in a product that just doesn't turn over mm -hmm. right and, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you have to mark it down or sell for scrap and so we have to pick and choose because we're not, you know, we don't, we don't have debt. We don't have uh, huge loans from any investors, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a limited amount that we want to make sure to allocate to the products that are the most sought after. And so that that's where that catch 22 comes where we can't have 10,000 SKUs. Rather, we choose the SKUs that are most popular and to be quite frankly, in the best interest, mostly of the end user. They may, may or may not know, but I think a lot of times some products are better than others. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, that, that makes some that makes perfect sense. Like, you know, because I was thinking about that question. You know, me doing channel bars myself, I was like, hey, that would be a cool question to ask and see your response. But, um, I, I kind of figured the answer would have been somewhere around that has to be about supply and demand, and you don't want to have a whole bunch of stuff in, you know. Yeah, and it's also too like how recognized is the product, right? If you come to mm -hmm. me with some 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 random zombie skull bar thing, you know, it's like I don't know this thing. I mm -hmm. I don't know the hallmark. I don't know the brand. And so you bring that say to your local coin shop. The guy may he may bulk because of that reason so mm -hmm. sometimes in my mind at least as an investor i like to have the things that are unarguable you know it's like hey it's a silver eagle buddy i can get the dollar over spot anywhere you can take it or leave <laughs> it, you know? it makes sense makes sense now um you yourself um james where do you see like gold or silver like where do you see it go either for 2019 and beyond so right now it looks like uh you know it's really a question of what's going to happen with the u.s dollar i think in terms of in the short to medium term uh, we've had a lot of dollar strength in the last couple of years, and that's yeah, it's put some pressure on the spot prices for silver and gold, et cetera. Uh, so on the long term, I, I don't think, you know, that given the situation that we are in the United States, as far as the debt levels and the un under unfunded pensions, and liabilities, et cetera, my belief is that long term, the release valve to all this is lowering the dollar's purchasing power exorbitantly. Um, something similar to something that you saw in 1933 when the dollar lost 70% to gold. 
my expectation is something like that's in our future. And so in the 2020s, we're probably looking at new nominal price highs in some year, probably, you know, in the early 2020s, perhaps even. Uh, it's just a question of, you know, I think short term, medium term investors are kind of looking to see what's going to happen with the stock market. What's the Federal Reserve going to do? But you look at their balance sheet and where the interest rates are right now and what's going on in the stock market. I mean, if they raise the interest rates even a little bit further, you could have holy hell break out. And, um, you know, I know what that was like. I worked in this industry in 2008 when the stock market really went crazy and people were really concerned about banks. I heard people on the phone. I talked to them. I helped them. And I I know the minutiae of that and I feel the scar of that still. And and I know that we didn't we didn't uh, we didn't fix anything. We just put band-aids over it, essentially. And so when that Band-Aid comes undone, I, I'm expecting, you know, to see the second half of that that play. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this intermission has been long and it's been drawn out, but I'm guessing there's going to be a second half and it's going to be louder than the first. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Now, uh, SD Bullion was founded in 2012, right? I know they started the Silver Doctors website in 2011. Now, I don't know if you have any inside information, like, um, as far as the mindset that Tyler was um, had when he was doing it. But did he foresee everything that's going like I'm talking about? He's like within the top five, correct? Yeah, we like, are a top five billion dealer as far mm -hmm. as revenue and, and people that come on our site. Sure. OK. Now, when he created it back in 2011, 2012, did he foresee all this success? Like did he say, hey, you know what? All this is going to happen or. <laughs> yeah, you, you would have to ask him direct. I, you gotcha. know, I, I was competing directly with him with another uh, at another outfit. And mm -hmm. uh, I remember them coming online and seeing the blog and, and seeing it grow and mm -hmm. it was uh it was amazing how much it, it grew and how much you know how many people came how many visitors came to the site etc so uh they were in direct competition not merely in a bullion form but also in news form and mm -hmm. so you know it was a question of well how do you get news how do you get people to come to your site sometimes you you know in news especially nowadays you have to be loud and you have to have angles and so it was a combination of the two, I believe. It was a combination of getting traffic to read the news that's industry related because there weren't that many websites doing it. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, you know, obviously they, they thought in terms of, well, you know, we have all these people out there who want to buy bullion. Let's go ahead and try this. And so I'm not sure if he, he would say he knew this is exactly what was going to be the outcome, mm -hmm. uh, but he's certainly excited about the future. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Now, um, I do have another question from TX Moon. He practically stated just in a nutshell, like um, he can he can go to any other um, retailers, right? And process a check or it'll be the same price as cash. He said, why for bullion dealers? Why is it that they, they process like a 4% processing fee if you're doing it with a credit card versus an e-check? And sure. why does it take a week? for you guys to process the actual check versus other places they can have that check cleared within um, the same day before they leave. Yeah, all right, so first and foremost, he's, he, I think he's talking about credit card and debit cards. Yeah. Uh, merchant accounts will charge anywhere from two and a half to up to you know three, three and a half percent typically, um, maybe even higher if you're talking about American Express. Mm -hmm. uh, to anyone who's using um, that for, say you're buying tennis shoes at a Nike store, they're mm -hmm. going to hit Nike, that Nike store with that merchant account fee. And the Nike store is cool because they they don't care. They're making 40% profit margin off you. And so they'll give the two and a half to the, the merchant account. But here we are, you know, I'm selling you a kilo of gold and mm -hmm. transaction, you know, so you're talking about basis points. You're making maybe a couple hundred bucks. Well, if the merchant account, if you use a credit card to pay for the thing, the merchant accounts, you know, I'm at a loss essentially. So the mm -hmm. only way for them, you know, for, for our industry to survive is to have a two tier pricing system. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. It just wouldn't work. We wouldn't be able to offer the service. And the other second point was about checks. So you have to be careful of fraud and precious metals are the one. It's one of the lone things that you can buy where if it gets stolen in, in mid route, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's a very, very private thing. And so if it gets taken, it's very hard to trace or track. Right. Precious mm -hmm. metals are one of the loan assets today they even that are are very very private and so it's a little bit um uh, counterintuitive i suppose the fact that we have to hold the check for that long but it's really to cover ourselves because once that package gets in the mail if it ends up being fraud uh we have we have a red alert we have to make sure that that product gets back and we don't lose out on it because as your you know end users as the people who come to your channel may know if you have mm -hmm. a fraudulent purchase in any precious metals it's extremely costly because they're expensive items mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that makes it uh -huh, yeah. keep going, sorry. 
Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's the main point. It's the it's the it's making sure that the counterparty isn't pulling fraud, and we're like the second highest targeted industry in in the entire world when it comes mm-hmm. to fraud. So, okay. no, that, that, that I was gonna say that makes perfect sense. Like even me, I, I when I saw the question, I was like, yeah, like why is that? But now that you explained it to me, it makes so much perfect sense. Like. I don't even like you know question that no more. It makes yeah. sense. Like I didn't think of that that it, way. You know, I've been I've been in this industry for a decade, and I've seen a whole bunch of craziness when it comes to the fraud. There's been, um, you know, years back there was this ring of African uh, guys from I think it was from Nigeria. They were in the United States, mm-hmm. and they were so advanced they would run to like the midpoint where the FedEx package was and use a fake ID to intercept the package there as opposed to ah. home. I mean, they were, I had to get involved with the Secret Service sometimes for, for some <laughs> of these things. I mean, it, it's amazing the level of intelligence involved with fraud and the, uh, people will use their talents to do bad things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you just have to be wary of that. And that's why it's kind of counterintuitive sometimes when you look at w- all the policies that various dealers have when, when it comes to payment. Okay, okay. Now, I, I do want to say, like, um, as far as SD bullying, like, for, for me, from with all the bullying dealers that I purchased from, they have to be, like, within the top three of mines um just simply because of the customer service like i i do believe that you guys do go out your way um as far as when i did a video and then you guys were one of the first person to actually reach out to me i don't know what i was talking about in that video per se but i know you guys were were right there like listening to what i had to say and you guys commented even um i said something on the previous video about e-checks and then um somebody uh emailed me and said hey you know, um, this is why this is such and now, hey, well, I'll take care. Of, I'll take care of it for you. So just give me your email. And then you see stuff like that. It, it shows that you guys really focus on the customer, even doing interviews like such, you know, like this. It shows that you're very in key with the customers. And I don't see all that much. Like if it were to come down to customer service, I'll say as the bullion has down. Well, it's good to know. I mean, it, we, we basically, you know, it's through hustle that we we're always trying to 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 gain recognition and to get people to, to come over and give us a shot. And uh, mm-hmm. in order to do that, you have to engage uh, and also speak with people and communicate and, and, you know, be more you know human about the industry and understand both sides. And mm-hmm. I can totally understand because I'm on the buying side as well. I know what that's like. It can be um, a little confusing at times. Some of these dealers are like black boxes mm-hmm. uh, and we don't want to be that. We want to be there to serve our customers and do it well. And that's, I, I think the whole strategy behind Okay. Okay. Now, for anyone who maybe, um, maybe actually, I just came up with this question. Um, just personally, your thoughts on it. What's your thoughts on, um, or advice as far as storing your precious metals? To make sure, um, where would you keep it, or you know, make sure it's safe where no one can yeah. come get to it. So I, I, my face is all over the internet involved with bullying. So I'm very careful or, or reticent to have it at my house, right? Mm-hmm. If I was just an average Joe Blow buying bullion, you know, it's it's pretty safe. I think to have a, a prudent, you know, small position in your house. We're talking you know, ten thousand, maybe a little bit more. It really depends on your risk profile. Mm-hmm. Some people, some people don't want any in their home, and that's fine. And some people put it all. And that, you know, the one thing about precious metals. You know, you can you can put it in places and no one will know. Maybe a loved one or two. That's about it. You maybe trust your wife or uh, someone else that you know that you can trust to know that if you say you got hit by a bus, where mm-hmm. they can find it, etc. Mm-hmm. So it's it's combination of a few factors. It's making sure that you know limited people know people that you trust and people who keep their mouth shut uh, because it is a dangerous thing if people know that you have a lot of uh, valuables in a certain place because uh, you know it's just the way it is. I've seen it throughout the industry. Throughout the last decade, I've seen various home invasions and different stories about people getting robbed at gunpoint. And that's mm-hmm. the last thing you want. So, we offer various things. You can, you know, I use it personally. It's, uh, you know, there's often there's oftentimes well-known brands out there that offer non-bank storage. I use one in Loomis uh, with, with Loomis. They're a, a company that has various storage facilities, one in LA and one in Miami that I use. Uh, they've been very, very good. I've had them over the years. Uh, some of my siblings even uh, have some storage with them. And I like that because, you know, for me, if my face is on the website. I, I don't want people, you know, thinking they can follow me home or, <laughs> so, you know, it's a, it's a question of your risk profile and making sure that, you know, 
people that you know and trust and love um, know where it is in case the worst were to happen. It also is helpful, I think, if you were you know, older or if you have a family, etc. It may not be the bad idea to have a living will, to have those mm-hmm. precious metals cited in that living will, maybe have it sealed in case mm-hmm. the worst were to happen, that you would know where to find and locate that stuff so people can use it, your heirs could. Okay, okay. Now, I do have uh, one last question from Yankee Stack, and you might have to bear with me here. All right, so it says, Yankee Stacking is considering explaining a bulk American Silver Eagle purchase with coal items opposed to BU quality. All right, what guarantee of weight and quality does SD provide with coal American Silver Eagles? Does the tube comes with 20, with an order of 20 like it does with the BU purchase? And will there be a competitive offering to those soon either on your website or on eBay? So uh, coal, coal Silver Eagles, I was just in the, at the pick pack and ship uh, location the other day shooting footage for an sd bullion about us video that uh, we made you can mm-hmm. youtube search that if you want to check it out but mm-hmm. um i think i might have left this footage on the cutting room floor but it was footage of one of the one of the employees was going through uh you know silver eagles that we had purchased uh i think back from a customer going through them and putting you know they were looking at the quality of them, putting them in, you know, different tubes, depending, right? Mm-hmm. So coals essentially are, are silver eagles that are, aren't in the greatest condition, uh, but they're still silver eagles. So okay. if you bought if you bought 20 ounces of coal silver eagles, you're still going to get tr- 20 troy ounces of weight. Uh, I know this for a fact because I've measured and weighed the silver eagles. They are the American. The U.S. men is very generous in the amount of silver they give in those silver eagles. They typically are over by, I forget the amount, but it's it's like a half gram on each silver eagle. You're getting additional just because they're so not uh, precise with the way that they make those. But they always err on the long side, and so it's it's not as if silver eagles are going through coin operating machines at Brinks. You know, they're not getting clanged, and, and they just get called. You know, usually through air exposure or maybe people, you know, having them in twos and they clang a bit. But so maybe they have a scuff here or there, but you're not going to lose much in terms of the troy ounce. So you'll you'll get what you're asking for in terms of the troy ounce weight. And if you don't, then document it and come back to us and show us. Uh, so that 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 is the main point. I think if you're buying coals, you're still getting silver eagles. Uh, they're still they're still going to be the guaranteed weight that we claim. Okay, okay. And uh, the second half of the question, is there any um, competitive offering to these soon, either on eBay or um, on the website? It really depends. You know, competitive offerings usually happen because we got a deal, we turn around and pass it on to our customers, right? So if we got someone selling us back a whole load of Silver Eagles, we probably have to go through them and, and, and check out the quality of them. And you may have a stack of coal, but it usually is rare. Um, most of the time they're in pretty good pretty good shape. So you'll, mm-hmm. you'll just be in the secondary Silver Eagle pile. Um, whether or not there'll be a huge sale or not is usually dependent upon inventory, you know, how much we have and, and basically at what price point and whether or not we can pass on savings and make a big deal out of the sale. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now uh, with that question, um, what I didn't understand was the call, cause that's the first time I've ever heard of that, but I'm assuming through context clues, that means like damaged uh, in, a, yeah. in a way, like through circulation. Right. Like oxidized, like, you, you gotcha. know, say you have a silver Eagle that's not in very good shape and it's been you know in the air and so it's kind of tarnished etc gotcha. yeah you know, we can't sell that as a as a silver eagle in, a, in the secondary pile if someone gets mm-hmm. that they're going to complain and it's going to bring blowback and cost to us so we have to have di- different piles for different conditions gotcha okay okay that makes sense that makes sense now um what is the process like um especially with time frame like let's say i were to sell my um, american silver eagle um, to you guys, what is the process, and how how do you guys go about that? Of course, I have to give, I have to get a quote from you guys and actually send it to you, and you guys expect it, see if it's worth anything, and then you give me a a, a requote, I say, or you know, now, after, mm-hmm. if you if you say you called us up and you were selling mm-hmm. us, you know, a thousand ounces or five hundred ounces of Silver Eagles, and um, we'd give you a quote, we we both agree on the price, we lock it in. Then you'd ship us the metals and typically you'd want to use USPS registered mail for your mm-hmm. own insurance purposes because okay. most people out there don't know you can't use FedEx, you can't use DHL, you can't use, uh, what's the other private one, uh, UPS because it's in their clauses that you're not supposed to ship precious metals unless you have a third party insurer. So if you're mm-hmm. just a regular Joe Blow, use USPS registered mail or we can provide you with something if it makes sense, um, you know, shipping and handling wise. We okay. can provide you with some type of insurance, but otherwise use USPS. SPS registered. 
So it's not the fastest if you go USPS registered, but it will get there. Uh, that is the safest method for shipping anything domestically in the United States. Uh, I've done the studies. I don't care what anyone says. If you are doing it individually, USPS registered is the safest methodology. And the reasons are pretty simple. Think about it. USPS people, why do they get the job there? It's usually to get that pension fund that's underfunded, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if something goes missing in a registered mailbox or par parcel, next thing you know, there's a postmaster general comes around. And if there's any fraud or anyone gets, gets caught stealing anything at the USPS, that whole underfunded pension that they were hoping to get, gone. <laughs> so it's not like uh, FedEx or UPS where they're paying their people peanuts with no pension plan or this or that. The incentive for someone there to do something stupid and start stealing packages is a lot higher than it is, say, for USPS. But the entire turnaround time of it all, say you called us, locked in the price, then you shipped it. I'd imagine, depending on where you, you where you are in the United States, it wouldn't take more than a week full in for it okay. to get here and then us to be able to send you off the payment. And, you know, if it's bank wire transfer, that's pretty fast. You could have your money within a week. If it's uh, by check, it'll be a little bit slower. But uh, that's that's typically the time frame, roughly seven days. Okay, okay. Now, um, be, being on that, have you ever received any um, fake silver? Like somebody call, say, I say, um, I call in, I'm like, hey, I have 20 American silver eagles, and then somebody send you, and it's like 10 real and then 10 fake. And yeah. what's the process on that? That's not happened yet. Uh, thank, thankfully, okay. uh, we've never had any major attempt at sending us fakes, uh, mm -hmm. at least on a large scale. None, mm -hmm. none that I've heard of. Um, you know, years back, I, I went and did some work uh, to find the highest quality fakes. So I had to, you know, think like a criminal. And I went out there and I, I bought all these fakes off off one of the uh, publicly traded largest Chinese uh, Internet websites uh, that claims that they don't sell anything uh, of, of precious. Ma I mean, if you go down their terms and agreements, they don't even they don't even they write the terms and agreements and they ignore their terms and agreements. So <laughs> it's just amazing what they do. But mm -hmm. so I got all these various fakes and some of the best ones were uh, at the time where the were like the Silver Eagle fake was it was pretty good. I, I remember showing it to a couple of industry uh, colleagues of mine and, and they had difficulty choosing which was the real one and which was the fake. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, just eyeballing it was difficult. But once you kind of got to know it, then you could tell just by you know trying to ding it or ring it. And nowadays we have all these different scanners and stuff that will show you immediately if it's fake or real. So the the I think the problem with fakes out there in the industry, there's probably two of them, two two major problems. One is on a peer to peer ratio. There's a lot of fraud out there. There's people who try to get over on other people who don't know what the hell they're doing. Mm -hmm. So you'll see those people taking advantage of people on Craigslist or at local pawn shops for the, where the you know, people at the counter have no idea what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's usually where the, the lower quality fakes get you know used and, and people get taken advantage of. The second uh, would be the highest quality of the Chinese fakes. Usually, I think it was a few years ago, maybe three or four years ago, where in the Diamond District in New York, a couple of really well done uh, 10 ounce, I think it was fake Pam Suisse gold bars with in, you know tungsten mm. insert were passed off. And the guy who got them, he just didn't trust it. So he drilled into it and he found a tungsten rod in the thing. So obviously some people in china have taken it to a whole new level and it's not surprising it's just like a it's like a sport over there to see who can get over on who and how well <laughs> and so you know when it comes to like really expensive bars there's other technologies you can use you know whether it be sound or, or other things that are non-invasive uh even specific gravity would have sniffed out the tungsten in that so um, those are two methodologies that you have to be wary of, especially when you're buying really, really large gold bars and, and you know, when you're talking about hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars involved. You have to be very, very wary of that because it is a threat. It's something you have to think of. Okay. Hey, good answer. Good answer. That makes sense. And um, the last question is, um, I actually, obviously, I have two ounces of copper right here. And I'm not sure. Do you guys sell copper on your website? Yeah, we have various copper bullion products. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's your thoughts on copper? So copper, you know, it's like, it's this strange, it was a monetary metal for a long time. And up till 1982, we had it in our pennies. Mm -hmm. uh, so copper is, you know, it's like a fourth monetary metal, but it's not precious, okay? Mm -hmm. So people like it in the sense that, the, you know, they get a lot for the little amount of currency that they put forth to get it. It's nice and heavy and it's kind of cool and the designs are neat, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're thinking about buying copper in terms of like I'm gonna make a whole 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 load of, of, of currency by putting <laughs> copper, I, I think I think you kind of you missed the point. You probably didn't even use a calculator or thought about it. Uh, you know, really, 
if you wanted to make a real copper play, I mean, there's there's dudes out there that do this that like go around and they separate 1982 the flex of uh, Cooper <laughs> nickel pennies that we have nowadays, and mm. you know go on coin inflation and run the numbers and figure it out if it's worth your time or not. But there are people out there who do that literally for a hobby or living and they make money doing it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that would probably be my main answer is it's not precious flat out. It's just not. Um, so when I look at precious metals, I think first and foremost, gold, silver, even platinum, palladium, I think have their case. And if you look at say, for instance, 1980, um, the last major precious metal bull market where they peaked, all four of those metals peaked, in price with all new nominal highs within months of one another. My expectation is that may be uh, something we see in the future again, especially if we have a question about the currency or the various currencies in the world and, and whether or not their value is going to be maintained. So if we have a currency crisis, you can expect all four of those precious metals will spike. Copper may do OK. I just don't think it will go um, hyperbolic or exponential like the precious metals might. Gotcha. Okay, and I know I said that was the last question, but since we are in a, a different type of precious metals like copper, what about rhodium? And do you guys have a plan to um, add that to y'all uh, to our SKUs, as you call it? Yeah. Uh, so the rhodium, I we don't currently have rhodium, and I, I definitely think the price has been percolating a, a little bit of late. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something I could uh, talk to Tyler about because sourcing rhodium can be kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. There's only a few few major sources for rhodium bullion out there. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't know enough about the fundamental factors in rhodium to really make an educated uh, answer on this. It's it, the chart looks very, very exciting, but as far as like you know like having a real clear-cut answer for you, I, I would be, I would be a, you know a, a remiss to even try and, and drop any knowledge on rhodium. Um, I, I just would sound like a damn fool. I think. <laughs> All right. Well, James, appreciate you. Thank you so much for being on the channel. It is an honor to have you on here, and thank you for reaching out. And that's pretty much all I have for you guys today. So one thing we forgot to mention is that if you're out there and you're interested in learning more about precious metals, I made a, a digital guide that people can get on our website. If you go to sdbullion.com, go to the far right under Resources tab, you'll see this little section called Investing Guide. You click Investing Guide, and it'll take you to a page where you can simply put in your email address and then click get ebook and it'll send you this PDF into your email um, that gives you a whole lot of information regarding precious metals, the mainly the fundamental case for why now makes sense. And then it also gives you a whole bunch of do's and don'ts when it comes time to like buy, how to do it intelligently, how to make sure you don't buy from dealers that are scamming, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's more or less, it's a pretty long book. So, you know, you're not going to read it all in, in one day, uh, but it, you know you can peruse it. I think you'll gain some in, in, some insight into it. My whole intention of it was to try and give you as much of my experience and knowledge so that you do it in a safe and uh, profitable manner. Okay, and I'm also going to have the link down in the description below so you guys can check that one out as well. Yeah, that'd be helpful. Well, thanks. I appreciate you adding that on there. Eli, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And all, your, all your viewers out there, th thank you. Uh,